earlier when I introduced all of the leaders today, I saved a name, Dr. Lynn Wallach, who was our liturgist this morning. Lynn has faithfully led us as our moderator through all of this time, this COVID time, and she was repeating her term. So this is the second year in a row she has been our moderator. And I wanna tell you her steady hand, her loving, humorous, gentle way has been the greatest gift that our church has known during this time. So thank you, Lynn, not just for reading the hardest passage of scripture that we've had in COVID time, but also just for being such a wonderful friend and leader of all, all of us. Today is Reformation Sunday 2020. It is the day we in the Protestant Christian tradition remember the actions of a monk, a German monk, Martin Luther, who on October 31st, 1517, took a hammer and a nail and put his 95 theses or grievances with the church into the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. I was thinking it must have been a lot that he had been saving up to come up with 95 things. It marked the beginning of a movement of Reformed Catholics, who we now know as Protestants. More than 500 years have passed since that day, and today I'd like to lift up Reformers of our times and through time who inspire us to move the needle to change the status quo and to make a difference. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We begin today on a mountaintop cliff overlooking promise. In Deuteronomy 34, we see Moses for the last time he has delivered his people Israel to the edge of the land of promise. Although he dies before entering the promised land, Moses has guided them through 40 years in the desert and generations of maturation as a people of faith. When he led their liberation out of, uh, out of Egypt, out of slavery, they numbered 600,000 people, now over 2 million are about to cross the Jordan River to the promised land. God takes Moses to Mount Nebo's peak. From there, Moses can see all of the future territory below him. To the north, there is the Gilead Range. Dan can be seen 100 miles away to the northwest. 65 miles to the west is the Mediterranean Sea, and to the south and southeast, the Negev Desert and the Plain of Jordan, 50 miles away. He can see all of this. He can see forever. There is a tenderness in this final scene of Moses' life. Mercy and serenity meet with God and Moses on the mountaintop. The gentle manner in which God deals with the faithful and diligent service, servant, servant is paradigmatic of God's great mercy, not only toward Moses, but toward Israel. And the serenity with which Moses accepts his own mortality reveals the peace that pervades his heart. Having seen it all, Moses dies there. He is buried in the valley of Moab in the place that no one knows, so a shrine can never be constructed. Through all his soaring triumphs and bitter disappointments, through all his public acclaim and private sadness, Moses dies physically healthy and honored by all his people. The liberator, the lawgiver, the reformer, Moses is gone. Of Moses, Nobel Peace Laureate and author Elie Wiesel has written, Moses is the most solitary and most powerful hero of biblical history. The immensity of his task and the scope of his experience command our admiration, our reverence, and our awe. His passion for social justice, his struggle for national liberation, his triumphs and his disappointments, 
his poetic inspiration, his gifts as a strategist and organizational genius, his complex relationship with God and with God's people, his condemnations and blessings, his bursts of anger, his silences, his efforts to reconcile the law with compassion, authority, integrity, and decency. No individual ever, anywhere, accomplished so much for so many people in so many different domains for so long. Moshe Rebenu, our master Moses, incomparable and unequaled. Thanks be to God for the reformer, Moses. Moses is joined by our reformer, Joshua Rabenu. Jesus, the new Moses, speaks as well of what matters most. We find him once again entangled in conflict. It seems to be a standard to the text in recent months. There he is with the religious elite, the Pharisees. They've come to him because he just finished silencing the Sadducees, which we hear about, and so the Pharisees are stepping up to try to see if they can trick him and trap him. They are opposed to him, believing he is not, in fact, any special agent of God on earth. They challenge him at every possible turn. When they try to pin him down with tough questions, Jesus doesn't take off his mic and stomp off stage right. He stays with it. That's what leaders do in real time, in real life. They stick with tough questions. Instead of leaving in a huff, he stands his ground and he quotes Moses in Deuteronomy 6.5. When they ask him about what the greatest law is, he says, well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's the Shema, the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he adds a little more. From Leviticus 19, 18, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And just as an aside, I want to remind everybody that's listening today that the very first stone laid in the pathway of justice was given by Congregation Tefereth Israel from Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Very powerful connection for all of us. Loving God is always first, Intertwining your love for yourself and your neighbor is a real close second. Then he says, on these two commandments depend all of the law and all of the prophets. So let's be clear. The first commandment is in fact first, love God. Nothing else matters without that our mandate in life is sort of lost. Love God with everything that you have. And then the second commandment is right there, love your neighbor as yourself. If you can't love yourself in healthy and productive, productive ways, how can you love your neighbor? Essentially, Jesus has just boiled down 613 laws into two. In doing this, he offers a vision for a better world. But this reformer of Levitical and De Deuteronomic law is not done. He turns the question back to the questioners. So, let me ask you a question. What do you think? What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They answer, well, that's obvious. Everybody knows that. He's David's son. And Jesus turns this completely around and points out that David calls the Messiah Lord. So, if David calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? Okay, now the Pharisees leave. They walk off stage right. He shames them into silence, if you will. He stumps the so-called stumpers, so they just stomp off. They don't have any more questions. And as far as we can tell in the Gospel of Matthew, they never come back. Did someone say the Messiah is in the house? Drop the mic. Throughout my ministry, Jesus, throughout his ministry, Jesus answered all his critics, nose to nose, face to face. He never backed down. He never turned away. He never apologizes for who he is and what he believes his relationship with God is and what our relationship with God is. Never. He never runs. 
That's what I call an amazing gifted leader. He is constantly about the work of reforming the laws of Moses. I've always loved the fact that in the, in the writings of the Christian scriptures, outside of the Psalms, the most quoted passages are from Deuteronomy. Now, as you know, Deuteronomy is the reforming law code of Judaism. It's the reform of Levitical law. So Jesus is the reformer of the reformed laws. Without a doubt, he is the first reformer of our Christian faith. A reformer is a person who makes changes to a system or to a law in order to improve it. A reformer looks at what is in place and points out where the flaws, where the inherent biases, where the prejudices are, and then goes about changing them. In our faith tradition, reformers ask, what is God doing? And where is God working? And what are the signs of the times? And what are they saying to the church? And how will the church respond to these signs of the times? We have a saying in our tradition, our reformed Protestant tradition, we are reformed and reforming so that we're constantly looking at how we can continue to be a part of the process of reformation. All of us should play our part in reforming the systems and the institutions of which we're a part. If we sense that something isn't right, we need to do more than whine about it. We need to change it. If we see someone is treated wrong, we need to address it. If we see that someone is left behind, we need to go bring them into the fold. That's what reformers do. A hundred years ago, women and men changed the laws of this land with the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, giving women the right to vote. And as I pointed out in my sermon way back in August, not all women got that right when the right was established because African American women were, and Native American women were not still given the right to vote. That's another sermon. The first election in which women voted was November 1920, 100 years ago, coming up. Eight million women voted. Only 36% of those who were eligible. And when people look at those numbers, they've wondered why that was the case. Well, many conservative women had opposed the 19th Amendment, saying that women should not have the right to vote. But guess what? When they saw how the vote turned out that November, that a lot of liberals were, were voted into office, they all registered and voted the next time around. Isn't that great? That's what the vote does. It gives you the opportunity to have a voice in democracy. So thanks be to God for all of the women, the first set and the second, who joined together to make a difference. That's how reform works. It is often perceived as helping only a small subset of people, but in fact, most reform floats the boat for many people. It raises the standards for all people. I have heard that from black authors and activists, that sometimes there are white folks who oppose the reforms that they bring because they think they're only going to help black folks. But they say they missed the point of reform. It actually helps everyone. When you raise the minimum wage, it helps everyone. It's not something that's designed or determined by color only. Lieutenant Melissa McFadden is a reformer. Lieutenant McFadden has been with the Columbus Division of Police for 24 years and is currently the highest ranking black female in the division's history. In her new memoir, just released in September, Walking the Thin Black Line, Confronting Racism in the Columbus Division of Police, Lieutenant McFadden tells her story as I have worked closely with Lieutenant McFadden over the past two years, I can tell you that she is an undaunted and courageous reformer. She is unafraid to speak truth with love to power. Thanks to her tireless work to overcome the racial and gender divisions within the Columbus police, she has shined a light on the racist troubles within the department. But I can also tell you that all of the reforms that she has called for will affect and strengthen 
all women officers. They will affect and strengthen all minority officers. And we have already seen that they will affect and strengthen all LGBTQ officers on the force as well. Calls for independent inquiries into discriminatory practices within the ranks. Intensive mental health care for officers who shoot and kill citizens. Community training, which brings the community and officers closer together. All of this is good for everyone, although they rise out of her experience and her cry for justice as a black female officer on the force. Interestingly, in the two years plus that I've worked with her, Mayor Ginther, Ned Pettis Jr., the, the Director of Public Safety, and Chief Thomas Quinlan have all agreed that all of the reforms that have call, been called for should be met. However, after two years and the rising protests in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis just five months ago today, they still have to implement three of the seven expectations they so heartily agreed were necessary. Reform sometimes doesn't come about unless you push and push and push. But these seven expectations should be accomplished by now. They should have been accomplished with a lot less resistance. Lieutenant McFadden is an amazing woman of God and a courageous warrior for equal rights. We in Columbus are blessed to have a champion and a reformer fighting for equality and racial justice in our police force. Reformers come in all ages, races, nationalities, shapes and sizes, and positions of leadership. You're gonna love this on the Reformation Sunday of Protestantism, but my favorite Christian reformer is Pope Francis I. I know you all want me to talk about his most recent film, in which he calls for civil unions, and I say, we brought him all the way to 1995. So that's good, that's good. He's getting there, right? Only 25 years behind, but he's getting there. Here on Reformation Sunday, though, I wanna shout out for the Pope in Rome, for the Bishop of Rome. Three weeks ago, on October 4th, St. Francis' feast day, Pope Francis went to Assisi, Italy, and he unveiled his encyclical, which Translated comes to all brothers and sisters. It is written to address a post-COVID-19 world. Sort of like a great song that takes us to a new day. I love the fact that he's moving us forward. Essentially, Pope Francis is calling us to hit the reset button and to take this opportunity of pandemic to shape a new world a new world in which everyone cares for everyone else. He builds the entire case around the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he underscores the responsibility of love for others based on our sharing Ubuntu, which translates as equality that emphasizes human virtues, compassion, and common humanity. It draws on love that builds a universality and, and joins together all people with all status of gender and origin and location. He challenges unbridled capitalism and the market economy and reiterates that the death penalty is inadmissible and condemns populist, narcissistic leaders who are concerned with their own popularity over the common good. Sister Simon uh, excuse me, Sister Simone Campbell says of these themes that are in this incredible encyclical, Pope Francis is sending a simple but jarring message to the world. We must move beyond continuous divisiveness and come together to build a world worthy of all God's children. He lifts up a theme that comes out of the Bantu tradition in South Africa. A person is a person through other persons, or I am because we are. I love that. I love that because it calls us to a place of acknowledgement that reform can't happen unless all of us come along. All of us are given an opportunity. All of us are lifted in the process. 3,291 years ago, Moses looked over the promised land and died there and was buried there. 
1987 years ago, Jesus reformed the law codes of Moses. 503 years ago, a monk in Wittenberg called the church and the world to change. A hundred years ago, courageous women voted for the first time in America. Four weeks ago, a police lieutenant revealed a terrible story of racism within the ranks of the Columbus police and called for it to end. Three weeks ago, a pope called for a post-COVID-19 world in which unity and reformation of our global economic system brings us closer together, where we all interact with all people equally. These are all great marks of reformers. So my question for you today is, how can you make a change where you are? Guided by mercy and serenity, such as Moses and God experienced on the mountaintop, guided by the conviction and focus of Jesus to get it clear, make it, make it clear, by the powerful drive of justice and equality of the suffragists, by the compassion of Melissa and the unity of spirit of Francis, I pray that we will do everything in our power to create and deliver a vision for a post-COVID-19 world. We begin today. Let us move forward from this day to make and create a different world, one in which we experience more mercy, more compassion, more unity, and always more love. Amen.